Good morning, everybody. Um, I am uh, broadcasting from Denver, Colorado. It is early morning. I just got my son ready for school and guaranteed he's going to run behind me a couple of times here before we get started. I'm pretty excited about the session today. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen so we can cover some of the basics um, of what we're going to be going over. So the session, as you saw from the sign up, was on advances in glaucoma management. Um, and this is a little bit different than some of the discussions we've had in the past where we go into some of the nitty gritty of um, the surgical maneuvers that we might do or some of the disease processes that might be a little bit esoteric, some of the less common things that we see. Today's actually going back to the basics. We're gonna cover some of the basic points for visual field in OCT, two of the primary ways that we diagnose and follow glaucoma in clinic with an emphasis on different tools <clears throat> that you can use in clinic um, starting tomorrow morning. So we wanna give you all of the tools uh, that will help you maximize the benefit of these uh, devices. In order to do that, we have um, excellent speakers that are joining us today. This is my first time working with both of them on CyberSight, and I hope this is the first of many sessions where we can work together. We have Danica Morelli, who is Clinical Professor, Assistant Dean of Clinical Education, University of Houston College of Optometry in Houston, Texas. Uh, and we also have Marta Pazos, who's calling from uh, across uh, the uh, Atlantic of where uh, Danica and I are both uh, sitting. She's a consultant and head of the ophthalmic surgery section, hospital clinic in Barcelona, Barcelona, Spain. Um, they're going to be covering two of these aspects, and I'll be moderating. <clears throat> so I'll do the quick introduction, as you're seeing right now, and then uh, we'll have Dr. Morelli cover visual field uh, for about 25 minutes or so. And then Dr. Pazos will cover OCT for another 25 minutes. Now, after that, we're going to go over a Q&A session for about a half hour or so. In the meantime, if you want to add in some questions, we have plenty of questions that came in before the session um, started, so we'll go over many of those. And then if you want to put in more into the Q&A box, um, we'll also address those live as we're going along. And then I might save some of those uh, questions for the uh, live Q&A between the three of us. So uh, without further delay, I'm going to hand this over to Dr. Morelli. I'll stop sharing, and then if you want to go ahead and share your signs and then get us started. Thank you very much for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here today. I'll start with my uh, disclosures here. A friend of mine recently said, we live in an OCT world, and not to uh, steal Dr. Passos's thunder, uh, I'm just going to say that visual field remains a critically important test to do in the evaluation of glaucoma patients, glaucoma suspects, both on the diagnostic end and throughout the glaucoma continuum. Uh, this is just one excerpt from the American Academy of Ophthalmology's preferred practice patterns that says visual field evaluation is a critical test, whether you're testing 24 degrees, 30 degrees, or 10 degrees using white-on-white Perimetry. So I don't think we're going to be getting away from visual fields anytime soon. <clears throat> Historically, we did 30-2s, but the 24-2 test pattern test 24 degrees superior, inferior, and temporal goes out the full 30 degrees nasally, which is where some early glaucoma mischief often occurs. So it's really an ideal test to do in glaucoma. And a little bit later on, I'll talk about the value of the 10-2. I'm going to start with a kind of a template for interpretation. I teach optometry students, and I always teach them to go about things in a very systematic way. So the first thing we're going to do is look at reliability. Is this a test that's worth evaluating? Then we're going to glance at our grayscale, but we're really going to dig into our deviation plots, evaluate the global index measures and our glaucoma hemifield test. And the thing that I always keep in mind is I'm looking for patterns of loss that are really specific and characteristic of glaucoma. And I always want to try to correlate what I'm seeing structurally on my nerve evaluation, my nerve fiber evaluation, and my OCT with the visual field. Reliability is really important. We don't want to spend time evaluating a test that's not giving us good information. Our catch trials are located in the upper left corner of most visual field printouts, and we have three catch trials. Fixation losses, which historically 20% or higher is considered an unreliable test, but there are a lot of patients who will have higher than 20% fixation losses. Maybe the instrument has misplotted the blind spot or they have a very small optic nerve, and you can still evaluate that 
field. I rely a lot on the technician who runs the test to tell me if the patient was looking around. And there's another fixation uh, metric that we can use, and that's our gaze tracker. It starts at the beginning of the test, goes all the way through the end. When we see a mark that goes up, that means that the patient looked away temporarily. If we see a mark that goes down, that just means the patient got caught during a blink. So this is also a very helpful uh, test for fixation. False negatives are a little bit tricky. They're designed to evaluate whether a patient is really paying attention to the test or not. The problem with false negatives is that patients with glaucoma visual field defects will have an increase in their false negatives just as a part of their visual field loss. So in a field that's relatively normal, high, high false negatives are an important metric for reliability. But in a patient who has moderate to severe field loss, we don't really need to look at those false negatives. And we're going to, again, rely more on our technician. False positives are the one of the catch trial that's really, really important. This is a patient who's just sort of triggered happy. They're pushing the button even when they don't see a stimulus, when a stimulus hasn't even been presented. And the problem with false positives is that it's going to make the visual field look much better than it really is. And it's going to hide some of those subtle depressions and defects. So false positives higher than 20% really are a marker of an unreliable test. The raw data, the actual threshold values, are not particularly useful in a single field analysis because the data is actually presented in other ways that's much easier to understand. Understand. And like I said, we're going to glance at the grayscale, which gives a set gray tone for a, a range of threshold values. But the grayscale is really not intended to make diagnostic decisions. It's really just to sort of say, hey, in this particular field, it looks like we have a problem in the inferior part of the field. Where we really want to pay attention is in our total and pattern deviation plots. And, and they're, they're slightly different, and I want to uh, sort of remind you of the differences there. The total deviation plot tells us at each point tested how far away from the expected value our patient is compared to age match normals. So if we have a zero, that means no deviation. The patient's exactly where we expect. A positive number means the patient is more sensitive at that spot, and a negative value means the patient is less sensitive at that spot. I don't pay too much attention to these numbers because I know that when these numbers reach statistical significance, they'll get flagged on the probability plot below. They'll get one of these gray tones, darker tones, meaning more uh, statistically significant. In other words, a deeper defect. So I typically look at the deviation probability plot. What happens between the total deviation plot and the pattern deviation plot is really important. So the easiest way to think about this is to think about a patient who has a cataract and has glaucoma. A cataract is going to cause an overall depression in that visual field, and the, the glaucoma is typically going to cause a localized loss, a nasal step, an arcuate bundle defect, or something like that. In the total deviation plot, if we have something that's causing a generalized loss, we won't be able to see that localized loss. So the instrument filters out, if you will, that generalized diffuse loss. And what we see on our pattern deviation plot is kind of what remains. This allows us to highlight those local defects that are more characteristic of glaucoma. Now, in this particular example, my total deviation plot and my pattern deviation plot look exactly the same. And what that tells us is that this patient doesn't have any significant generalized loss. This is a 72-year-old patient. They've already had their cataract surgery. But here's an example where you see a big difference between the total deviation plot, which looks all dark, very depressed visual field, and the pattern deviation plot, which shows us that this patient has a superior paracentral defect that would be consistent with glaucoma. In the first two fields, the patient had a significant cataract. In this last visual field, you can see that the total and pattern deviation plots look similar, and that's because the patient had their cataract removed. So if I were going to spend the most time on any one particular map, it would be on my pattern deviation probability plot. Our global index measures are underneath the grayscale over here, and those are single number representations of the visual field. The mean deviation just tells us on average how depressed or elevated is this visual field compared to normal. So it's not going to be able to tell us that there's localized loss. It's just going to tell us an average of the uh, deviation across the visual field. The pattern standard deviation, like it implies, is really going to highlight localized pattern-specific loss. 
us. So this is kind of a measure of how smooth the shape of the hill of vision is. So if there's a big chunk taken out in a nasal step or an arcuate bundle defect, the pattern standard deviation is going to highlight that by increasing in its number. The more recent of the global index measures is the visual field index. This is probably the easiest to understand because it's an it's an age normalized percent of normal vision for this visual field test. So it ranges from zero parametrically blind, the patient can't see any stimulus that was presented to 100%, which is this patient's vision is normal on this test. The glaucoma hemifield test capitalizes on a really important finding in glaucoma visual field defects. If we think about the, the pattern of the retinal nerve fibers on the temporal side of the disc, they have this really ultimate respect for the temporal raphe. They don't cross over that horizontal midline. And that means that glaucomatous visual field defects don't cross the horizontal midline. So we're looking for asymmetry between the top of the field and the bottom of the field. The glaucoma hemifield test compares mirror image clusters of points above and below the horizontal midline and lets us know if there's a significant difference in the superior and inferior field. There are a lot of different messages that the glaucoma hemifield test can give us, but when it says outside normal limits, that's a strong message that we have a big difference between the superior and inferior parts of our field. This is a really sensitive test at detecting that asymmetry top to bottom, but it's not specific to glaucoma. We can all think about different conditions that might result in a, an asymmetry between our superior and inferior field. If you had an inferior retinal detachment, for example, or another type of optic uh, neuropathy, like an ischemic optic neuropathy, or a branch retinal artery occlusion, any of those could cause a difference above versus below the horizontal midline. That's going to trigger an outside normal limits glaucoma hemifield test, even though it's not glaucoma. The one thing I always think about, and I try to teach my students when I'm teaching them about evaluating uh, visual fields, is to look for patterns consistent with the diagnosis of glaucoma. Sometimes we can get sort of distracted by things that aren't really significant, and glaucoma tends to have three specific patterns of loss. Nasal step defects, which simply means a difference in sensitivity above versus below the horizontal midline in the nasal hemifield. Classic arcuate bundle defects, which represent these arced nerve fiber bundles, and paracentral scotomas, which we see here on the uh, bottom here and here, which are often seen in patients with normal tension glaucoma. I'm also looking for structure function correlation. So when I look at this optic nerve, I see an inferior notched rim. There's diffuse loss of uh, nerve fiber layer inferiorly, but I also have a kind of a medium-sized localized nerve fiber layer loss superiorly. When I look at this nerve, I expect, and in fact I see, a large, dense, superior arcuate defect that correlates with this inferior nerve fiber layer loss and inferior notch. And I also see a smaller but not insignificant <clears throat> inferior nasal depression as well. This is characteristic of glaucoma. Here's another patient who has what looks like a pretty healthy neuroretinal rim all the way around until we get to about five o'clock and there's this very localized notch. We see it on our OCT, both in the retinal nerve fiber layer and in the macular ganglion cell scan. And I would predict this is going to be a much more localized visual field defect. And in fact, I see a superior paracentral defect. Again, pretty consistent with normal tension glaucoma. We're always looking for pitfalls, right? Where can we go wrong when we're looking at these visual fields? And I think there are three main things that we can do wrong. One is evaluating a test that's actually unreliable. There's no point in doing that. Number two is not recognizing that a visual field defect is actually an artifact. And number three is overlooking other causes of visual field defects and kind of calling everything a glaucomatous defect. I like this slide because it gives us a lot of information about those patients who have high false positives. Those trigger happy patients. They're just clicking, clicking, clicking. We will see high false positives in our catch trials. In this example, it's 68% false positives. We'll see very high suprahuman threshold values. No one has threshold values of 50, and yet here they are on the test. We'll see white in our grayscale, 
these threshold values are so high that the instrument doesn't even have a great tone for them. So that's a really key finding there. Uh, and when we have this total pattern deviation kind of swap, normally we expect the total deviation plot to look worse and the pattern deviation plot to look better. When it's reversed like this, it means that the instrument, instead of raising up the visual field to get rid of an overall depression, it's kind of having to push the field down because of an overall artificial elevation. So I always look for these things to know if I'm looking at a reliable test. There are a lot of artifacts. I think probably a big artifact is mistakenly um, missing the fact that the patient has a learning curve. So the first field might look worse, the next test looks a little better, and so on as the patient learns to take the test. So we don't want to put too much uh, into the first visual field unless it really highly correlates with our structural findings. This is another common artifact. This occurs from the outer ring of the trial lens that's put in front of the patient. More common with the high plus lens, but it can happen with any lens if the holder of the lens is not close enough to the eye, if it's too far away from the eye. We'll see this less with a 24-2, typically on the nasal side. And that just means we need to go back and retest and push that trial lens a little bit closer. This is a characteristic called clover field artifact. The instrument thresholds four points, one in each quadrant first, and then begins to fill in the thresholds of the other points. If the patient starts off paying a good attention, but then quickly loses attention, maybe they start to kind of doze off or fall asleep, what you'll end up with is these four points that look pretty normal in what looks like an overall depressed field. This field is not necessarily depressed, we just need to repeat it with better instructions and maybe a better rested patient. Overlooking other causes of visual field loss kind of goes back to trying to correlate it with the structural changes that you see. This is a patient who was sent to me because his screening visual field was abnormal. And when you look at his visual field in isolation, it looks like he has a superior arcuate bundle defect. And so this could absolutely be a glaucomatous visual field loss. But when we look at his fundus, we see that he has some retinal scarring here. He had an injury as a child. This is not a glaucomatous optic nerve, this visual field loss is due to this retinal damage. So we don't want to ascribe it to glaucoma when he doesn't really have glaucoma. I said I would come back to the 10-2, and if you had asked me 15 years ago, uh, you know, what do I think about 10-2s, I would say I use them when my 24-2 shows advanced loss, but there's still some threshold values in the center of the visual field. So when we look at the threshold values, the majority of them are less than zero. That means we're spending a lot of time testing points that will not respond, testing parts of the retina that will not respond to stimuli. But we don't want to stop doing visual field testing because this patient has some usable vision in the central 10 degrees. This image on the right shows the large spots are the points on a 24-2 test, and these little tiny points are the points on a 10-2 all within the central 10 degrees. And instead of being six degrees apart, they're more finely spaced at two degrees apart. I always think about this as kind of zooming in on a satellite map so we can really see the details in the very small area that we're concerned with. So when we take this patient and we run them with a 10-2, we now have a lot more points that have registered threshold values that we can follow for change without spending a lot of time on that 24-2, you know, testing points that aren't going to give us any information. When you move to a 10-2, you do need to look at the rest of the field and ask yourself if you still need to continue doing a 24-2. In this case, if we go exclusively to a 10-2, we may lose this arcuate defect beginning to expand into the temporal side. So sometimes we have to go back and forth between a 10-2 and a 24-2. A more recent question is whether or not there's a role for the 10-2 visual field in early glaucoma. And this question is really coming from uh, some newer information that we know about early loss in the macula. Uh, a lot of this work comes from Don Hood at Columbia University. And I wanna draw your attention to this image on the right-hand side of your screen. So obviously we have a fundus image and superimposed on that, we have a macular ganglion cell interplexiform 
layer, OCT. And then this red donut here, this red ring in the center, this is where our ganglion cells are at their peak density. We know that there is some oftentimes early loss of these ganglion cells but if we look at all of these black squares, which represent the points on a 24-2 visual field, in that area of densest ganglion cell population, we're only testing four points. So we're sort of undersampling that area that may be damaged in early glaucoma. If we go back to our test points of 24-2 versus 10-2, you can see this square outline represents this area of the macular scan, the OCT scan. So we're we can test much more finely in that central 10 degrees and maybe uncover some early visual field loss associated with early ganglion cell loss in the macula. So this is a patient I like to talk about. Uh, he is a previous high myope, had laser refractive surgery, and now is hemotropic. But when you look at these discs, there's always the question, oh my gosh, are these glaucomatous optic nerves or all the are these just myopic discs? You don't have the value of a stereoscopic view, but I'll tell you that I was particularly concerned about the infratemporal rim in the left eye. When I looked at his first 24-2s, I'll be honest, I didn't see anything that screamed glaucoma to me. And I thought, eh, these are first visual fields. Let's see what happens on repeat testing. But when I looked at his OCT, I was struck by this very characteristic loss of macular ganglion cells. And it made me go back to his visual field in that left eye and say, gosh, does this one paracentral point superiorly, which I was willing to overlook, um, really represent maybe some visual field loss? So I did the 10-2 on this patient, and sure enough, there's a pretty sizable depression that actually corresponds very well to the ganglion cell loss in this case. Now, I always get the question, are you running 10-2s on all of your glaucoma suspects and early glaucoma patients? And I think there's probably disagreement among practitioners. My answer is absolutely no. I run 24-2s as my standard glaucoma test, but if I have a patient with a normal 24-2 or relatively normal 24-2, and I see this ganglion cell loss in the macula, then I will run a 10-2 to see if I can find some visual field loss that correlates with that damage. There is a new test pattern on the Humphrey Field Analyzer called the 24-2C pattern. This is, uh, the C stands for central. It is a standard 24-2 test with five additional test points in the central 10 degrees above the horizontal midline and five below the horizontal midline. These are represented by those blue points there. And this is in a way, a little bit of a hybrid test between a 24-2 and a 10-2, allowing us to sample a little bit more of those ganglion cells in the macula without having to run two separate tests. I have this test, I don't use it frequently. It looks a little strange when the printout comes out because of these additional test points. I'm kind of getting used to it right now. So I spent a lot of time talking about the single test point, right? The single uh, field analysis. In, and what I wanna talk about for the last few minutes is identifying progression in glaucoma visual fields. This is a much harder task than just recognizing that a visual field is abnormal. And that's primarily because of long-term test-to-test -test variability. We know that the more normal visual field will have some test-to-test -test variability, but it's a pretty tight uh, range. As our visual field gets worse, the amount of fluctuation that we have from test to test increases. And it can increase up to three or four times the amount of fluctuation that we would have in a normal visual field. So when we have a patient, if we had perfect test to test repeatability, we would follow this, follow this black line. When we have a test that looks worse than our baseline, we're always having to ask ourselves, is it worse, but remaining within the expected amount of fluctuation or has it exceeded that test to test variability? Now, now we can look at an overview, which just has every visual field in a row. And in this particular example, it's really easy to say, yeah, this patient's visual field has gotten much worse. They went from a very small inferior nasal step to a large, dense inferior arcuate and a new superior nasal step. This one is a lot harder. This patient has had six visual fields over the course of two years. And I think that if we polled our audience, we would have some people saying it looks like it's progressed, some saying it looks like it is stable, and a lot of us saying, I'm not really sure. It can be very difficult 
I've already said our grayscale is not really good for making decisions. We can look at our threshold values, but that's time consuming and difficult to know how much change is real or significant change. We can look at our probability plots, but you can see there's a lot of variability over time with those plots. And we can look at our mean deviation and pattern standard deviation for change over time. But there's a little bit of fluctuation in those values too, probably about two decibels worth of uh, variation from test to test. An important thing to think about when you're trying to determine progression is how often should we do perimetry? How often should we be doing visual fields? We know from a lot of studies, but the OAT study in particular, that abnormalities or changes in visual fields that we see are often, most often, not repeatable on repeat testing. And the World Glaucoma Association says that we should repeat suspected visual field progression not once, but two times to make that confirmation. Bao Shahan uh, published a paper about uh, 15 years ago that recommended six visual fields in the first two years, and that that was kind of the ideal balance of not testing like crazy, but being able to detect those patients who have rapid progression within the first two years. It's going to take us about five visual fields to be able to accurately detect progression if we're confirming with two consecutive fields. And so if we're only doing one visual field test per year, it's going to take us five years before we know if our patient is progressing, and that's really too long. The question always comes up, is it practical to do six visual fields in two years? It's really not that hard. It's one test at baseline with a confirmatory test shortly after that, maybe within a couple of months. A test at six months, 12 months, 18 months and 24 months, and there you have your six visual fields. At the end of that two years, you're going to know one of two, one of three things. Your patient is one of those patients who's progressing rapidly and their treatment needs to be escalated. Your patient is stable and the treatment that you're you know, administering is sufficient, or your patient's not a very good field taker and you may need to rely more on your OCT or your optic nerve evaluation to tell if the patient is changing. Other things may influence frequency of visual field testing, particularly if the visual field is impacting the central vision and if the patient has other risk factors for progression like repeated disc hemorrhages. I want to talk a little bit about the GPA. This is a progression software on the Humphrey Field Analyzer. But before I do that, I want to mention that just due to time, I didn't have time to talk about the octopus perimeter, which is a common perimeter that's used around the world. I will tell you that they pretty much have the same types of analyses. They're just called different things. So I'm talking about one instrument, but there are similar programs on other instruments. GPA is a software that was based on glaucoma patients retest uh, variability. And so they kind of defined this test to test variability for us in real glaucoma patients. The GPA will tell us information in two different ways. Event analysis is what I call the yes no question. Has today's visual field gotten worse compared to the baseline? And that's going to be based on whether or not individual test points exceed the expected amount of test to test variability. If they do, we'll get a little triangle. The first triangle is white. If the next test has the same amount of variability, it, the triangle will fill in halfway. And a third consecutive test, if that same exact point is still exceeding test-to-test -test variability, we'll get a black triangle. If you get three half-filled triangles, you'll get a message that says possible progression. If you get three black triangles, you'll get a message that says likely progression. The other way that the GPA shows us whether the patient is changing is with trend analysis. And so once we have five reliable visual fields, this test will give us a slope of the rate of change of the visual field index. And that will help us to identify the rate of change and hopefully identify those patients who are progressing at a rapid rate. This is what the GPA looks like. We have our two baseline fields, we have our trend analysis, and then we have our individual follow-up exams with our triangle analysis. So on this particular example, we have you know, a few points that have exceeded the expected test-to-test -test variability for the first time. And we have one point right here that last time exceeded the test-to-test -test variability and again today, so this triangle fills in halfway. Now, these are not enough to say that we've detected progression.
we can look at the VFI trend line here, it will assume linear progression and show us not only what is the rate of change in percent per year, but also if things keep going the way they are right now, where will the patient be in five years? Now, some instruments and some data management systems have the capability to uh, create a trend line of the mean deviation instead of the visual field index. So this is an example of Forum, which is a data management system. In this case, we are trending or we are watching the trend of the visual field index. And if you look at this patient who's had a lot of visual fields over the course of 10 years, it tells us that the rate of progression is 2.4% of the visual field index per year. Now, if you think about the dynamic range of, mean de of the whole visual field in decibels being about 33 decibels and 100% of visual field index, uh, one decibel is probably equal to about 3% per year or 3% of the visual field index. So this patient is not progressing at a particularly high rate. But that's not the whole story. If we look at the baseline visual fields here and we look at today's visual field, no one can deny that this patient has had pretty remarkable progression to uh, really severe visual field loss. And if you look closely, it looks like this patient was doing pretty well for a long time and then sort of has had some rapid uh, progression. What you can do is go in and create a second time point that you create a baseline. And if we do that, we see that for seven years, this patient had a rate of essentially nothing, no progression at all. And over the past three years, they're having a 10% uh, change in their VFI per year. That's more than a three decibel change per year, which is really dramatic, a dramatic rate of progression. This patient needs escalation of their therapy, especially given the fact that they're only 72 years old, potentially have a long time to live. There are a lot of subtleties to this glaucoma progression analysis, but I'm going to leave it there. I wanted to put up this slide with some additional resources. If you want some more resources, I believe this excellent perimetry um, uh, book is available as a free download. Uh, you just have to Google it and I think you can get a download. Uh, and it's an excellent book on the basics of perimetry. So with that, I'm going to uh, stop my share and we will go back to Dr. Kahook. That's great. Thank you so much. That was a lot of information in a very <laughs> short period of time. And uh, but everything in that talk was extremely valuable. So I think it's a, it's a great primer uh, for those Thank who you. are starting to use visual fields. So I thought did a great job. Thank you. Uh, and now let's move on to an equally abundant uh, information field with uh, OCT. Uh, so Dr. Martha Pazos is going to um, cover essentially the same type of uh, information that was just covered for visual field, but in turn for OCT. And please keep the questions coming. Uh, so I'm trying to answer some of these as we go along. I'll save some of these for the Q&A, uh, but we'll have about a half hour Q&A after this session is uh, done with Marta. So Marta, I'll hand off to you and uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Kahook, uh, for, the, for the invitation. And I'm very happy to be here today. And in the next minutes, I'm going to try to give you some tips on how to optimize and, and taking the most out of your of your OCT. These are my disclosures. And as you all know, OCT is able to give us a lot of information about glaucoma and about the glaucomatous neuropathy. And actually it brings us a global evaluation uh, that goes uh, basically into three different aspects, which are the rim, the retinal nerve fiber layer, and the ganglion cell layer. What I suggest is that for the everyday practice, that you're systematic, and I always take into account these four points that I have uh, written down here. Uh, the first of them is very, very important and is assessing the quality of your, uh, of your image, of that test. And, that, and the first thing you have to have in your mind is this GIGO effect, which means that even if you're a fantastic doctor, if garbage gets in, garbage will get out. So it's very important that you have a good quality image before interpreting if that particular patient has or not glaucoma. Which are the most important sources of error? There are two different things, two different situations that, that I'm sure that you've heard, which are the green disease and the red disease. The green disease is basically a false negative. So the OCT looks normal, but 
actually this patient has some clinical evidence of having glaucoma. So it means that it's green, but the patient is sick. On the other hand, there's the red disease, which is a false positive, in which the OCT is abnormal, but actually the patient is healthy. And it's very important, I will repeat this several times in the presentation, that OCT even on its own is not able to provide a diagnosis of glaucoma. We have to do that together with a clinical examination. So how can we do to know that our image is of good quality? There are basically two things. One is signal strength and the other is ruling out artifacts. For the signal strength, it's important that you know your instrument. There are different instruments out in the market and there's a number that basically can, you can look in the book of your, of your instrument, in the manual, and under that amount of strength, under that amount of light, you should not take that image into account. And this is different, as I said, for each instrument. For example, for Cirrus, it has to be six or more. For Spectralis, it has to be 20 or more. For OptiView, it has to be six or more, but it actually depends on your instrument. This signal strength can be affected by other factors. So it's lower in patients that have low visual equity, and it's very affected by cataract, and also it's actually lower in myopes. So all of these you have to take into account. And why is this important? Because if you have a low signal strength, then because the disease, then because, sorry, the instrument will detect less light, automatically it will think that there's more thinning. So lower signal strength actually results in lower thickness, which is not true thickness. And this is more important when as lower as this signal strength gets. So for example, for signal strength, this is a study done in Cirrus, for signal st strength between three or six, it does have a mild impact, but for those that are really low, like lower than three, it has a substantial impact. And in advanced glaucoma, it has been shown that those changes in signal strength really affect. So please only take into account those images that have good signal strength for your particular instruments. The other aspect that we have to take in mind is the artifacts, because they are much more frequent than we think. They can happen, it depends also on the different studies, but they can happen up to 15 to 46% of the images that you take, as much as almost half it could be. So please check the segmentation. You can see sometimes uh, decentrations or movements like here. Uh, also pieces of the images that are gone. And look, for example, this, this image here in which basically this uh, macular segmentation cannot be right. So check segmentation because those things can have a dramatic impact on your measurements. In the retinal nerve fiber layer, the more common is to have decentration followed by a posterior vitreous detachment. So look for that in the segmentation. And macula, the more common cause of artifacts is epiretinal membranes. So take that into account. And again, only evaluate those uh, images that are good quality. I have some cases here for you to see. This is a patient that was referred for, because they were thinking that the, maybe it had glaucoma, pressure was normal. And they are, this is an example of red disease because here you can see this unusual quadrant for glaucoma, which is a nasal quadrant. But if you look at the segmentation, even more than that, you can see that there's this posterior vitreal detachment that actually is doing a shadow right here. And that's why in this circle of measurement, you get this artifacted thinning. You can also take a look into these graphs. And when you see thinning that goes up to zero, this is never normal. Uh, we will talk in a little bit later about the floor effect. And basically, in normal anatomy, the retinal nerve fiber layer never goes down to zero. So if you see a zero somewhere, that means it's very likely an artifact. This is another case. It may be a patient that we, we were seeing this patient for some time for ocular hypertension. And if we take a look at in the ganglion cell layer, it may look like it's worsening. Is actually a paracentral damage that he or she is developing? Uh, no. Uh, in this case, if you look at the segmentation, this patient had also diabetes. And 
what was ha happening here is that he or she was developing uh, macular edema. So, you know, check the segmentation because in the macula, other things can happen and they will completely, completely alter our ganglion cell layer measurements. And again, this is another example. This is a, a patient in which if we do this, look, this low quality here for this particular uh, instrument, uh, they show you here in red that the, that the quality is below uh, what we want. And this is not well-centered. It is cut on top of here. And if you do take the image correctly, then you have good quality. And then this is not cut anymore. And basically, you, you get a completely normal patient. So again, you know, quality is very important because it can make uh, that you diagnose things that are not glaucoma or that you think that uh, a patient with glaucoma is healthy. Now, next step is diagnosis. So going back to those different parameters that the OCT can measure, we will go first for the rim. The rim values, like the size, the cupping, the nerve uh, area, those give us a first idea in a, at, a, at a first glance of the optic disc appearance. They are useful to detect asymmetry and to have in mind the disc size uh, and how this can affect, but they are not the most useful parameters of them all, although some rim parameters, like for example, the minimum rim width, which is a parameter that's available in spectralis, have shown that they may be better in tilted discs. So it does give us some information, especially for detecting asymmetry. But the big thing is still today, the retinal nerve fiber layer analysis. Still today, it has not been overcome by any other parameter when assessed uh, individually. It changed before visual field damage occurs, so it's useful to detect early change, and it just has a very good uh, discriminative ability with areas under the curve greater than 0.9. It's very useful in early glaucoma, in mild to moderate glaucoma, not so useful in advanced glaucoma. And the best parameters uh, are the average thickness and the inferior thickness always have in mind that glaucoma typically happens temporal inferior. So that's why those parameters are typically the best ones. The second very important parameter uh, that we use is the ganglion cell layer. Uh, it is very useful in early glaucoma in suspects to detect early change, paracentral changes, focal damage that occurs, especially in patients with normal tension glaucoma, and we have seen also a very nice example of this with, with the talk of Dr. Morelli, in which you can see these shapes that look like a donut almost that has a little area that has been beaten. Uh, this has also been called the Rafe sign. And this has been also very useful in, you know, funny discs that are sometimes difficult to assess. It, it's helpful to look for these images. The most important uh, parameters here are the average parameter and also the minimum uh, thickness parameter. But in the latest uh, times, there has also been uh, a tendency to look at the deviation map. So I encourage you not to only look at the numbers because sometimes metrics in OCT cannot, uh, can, can be difficult to assess, but also take a look at the segmentation and at the deviation map. Sometimes when we, you just look at sectors of global indices, you can miss some glaucomatous damage. And if you see in the retinal nerve fiber layer, those, those wedge defects, this is very likely a glaucomatous uh, damage. And when you see in these areas, as we said, this roughest sign or this snail shell appearance, also think that this patient uh, very likely has a, a glaucomatous uh, neuropathy. And this has been helpful, as I said, in tilted disc or in patients with myopia, in which sometimes uh, those parameters are difficult to assess. But in the latest uh, years, there have been out some studies showing that uh, it's very important to combine parameters and that actually, if we are able to combine things, we get best results. So we don't need to use one or the other, but use one and the other. And I have some examples for you about that. For example, this is a patient that has, it's myomyope, 
um, he has this slightly tilted disc with this peripapillary atrophy. We do this uh, fill, this 24-2 fill, in which there are, like in Dr. Morelli's example, some, you know, very early points, maybe it's first fill. We're not very sure if this is glaucoma or not. This is the rim, as I said, this temporal inferior damage. This is the retinal nerve fiber layer um, thickness in which this is this borderline area. We're not sure. Look here, this, again, this temporal inferior area of the graphs. This is very likely glaucoma. But if we do a macular OCT, we see this roughest sign, this snail shell appearance, which confirms that very likely this patient has glaucoma. This is another case you actually don't need an OCT, an OCT to know that this patient has glaucoma just by the clinical examination. You see these very pretty uh, wedge defects in the retinography. And look, you know, if you look at the OCT, it's green. You know, this is an example of green disease. But if you look deeply, you will see here in more detail those wedge defects in the deviation map. Actually, you can see some asymmetry. Again, asymmetry. I say always this to my residents. It looks it smells glaucoma when you see asymmetry. Um, and if you do the, sorry, if you do the macula, for some reason, this is not. Let me, maybe, here is the good one. Sorry about that. Yeah, for some reason, this animation is not working, but I'm showing you right here. So if you do the macula, you see this snail shell appearance. And even with this normal uh, OCT, look that the visual defect is already there with some paracentral damage. So it's with, with a fixation that's already affected. So it's not as, as a few damage as it looked like only with the, with the OCT. Now it's working. Well, let's go now for structure and function relationship uh, because this I think is very helpful. When things match, when the structure match, matches function, that's something that helps us to be more sure that this patient has glaucoma. First, I want to, to let you know that structure and function relationship depends on glaucoma severity. So in early glaucoma, in which we have more thickness, then visual fin doesn't change that early. Structure change early in time. So OCT is more valuable than visual fin in early glaucoma. At the end of the spectrum, in advanced glaucoma, then OCT reaches what we call the floor effect. So it cannot go lower. It, it's a question of a dynamic range of the instrument. So it cannot measure anymore. At that point, there's still some way to go for the visual field. So in advanced glaucoma, visual field gives more information than OCT. And there's this intermediate situation in you know, established moderate glaucoma in which structure and function are more correlated. So it's important that you have that into account when you look for structure function relationship. Also, and uh, Dr. Morelli has also commented very nicely that 24-2 sub sometimes does not uh, study well central damage because only four tests fall within the central eight degrees of vision. So that's why you have to look at the macula and OCT sometimes is an easy way to do that. I have an example. This is a 55 year old female with a normal tension glaucoma. Look how this uh, notch is right here, temporal inferior. If we take a look at the field, we may think it's not that much, uh, but look here. Uh, how the retinal nerve fiber layer is affected, and also this defect of the ganglion cell layer. And if we then do a 10-2, as uh, Dr. Morelli suggested, you will see that this is much more than we thought. And basically, this alteration is affecting fixation. So it's good to take a look at the macula. OCT, macular OCT, can help us to further uh, assess function because of the structure uh, relationship with, with it, and it's an easy, quick way to take a look at the macula. Last minutes are for progression. It's important to evaluate structure over time, bearing in mind that still today, the gold standard for detecting progression is visual field testing, but structure can give us some tools uh, to complement our detection of progression. My advice is to use trend analysis 
is more intuitive and simple, and it's able to detect more size with clinically significant progression. And it has been shown to be the most important parameter to start treatment. It's important, as it happens in the visual field testing, to have enough tests, at least five tests in two years, because that's the way that the device can give you a reliable rate of structural progression. And we can assess this change over time, again, with the same parameters. My recommendation is to use retinal nerve fiber layer and ganglion cell layer. Again, retinal nerve fiber layer is the most used parameter. It has a high sensitivity. And because this structure function relationship that I talked about is very useful in early glaucoma, but because of the floor effect, not so much in advanced glaucoma. It's important to know that there's a variability to the instrument. So just because of the instrument, if we do several tests, we can have up to five microns difference from one test to another test done the same day for the global uh, average. So everything that's between these five microns, it's just variability of the testing. That's something that we have to have into account. The other thing that we have to have into account is that because of aging, there's a decrease in retinal nerve fiber layer, that's up to five microns in 10 years. That's how I remember, five microns of variability, five microns of change in 10 years related to aging. Why do I say that? Because these instruments are not correlated by age. And if we age, we will lose um, retinal nerve fiber layer. Some studies have been done uh, to see that. So, be careful with significant slopes because we if we only take a look at that, we can have high false positives. And what we think because of several studies is that if you just wait enough, if you only take a look at these statistically significance of the slope, everybody will progress if you wait enough time. So you have to go to the 5% uh, limit of this uh, normal normality and that's about one micron per year. So if you see a loss that exceeds that micron per year, very likely this is clinically significant. And again, I have some examples for that. So for example, this is a patient that has a pretty stable visual field, is a very early glaucoma. Look here, they, there are some points, but the field looks about normal. But if we take a look to the retinal nerve fiber layer over time, we see that actually there's some loss over there basically more than three microns per year, which when we take a look at the event analysis, which is the more focal change, we can see that something is happening here inferiorly. And with time, now the visual field also is showing some changes superiorly. So probably here, only with the changes that, uh, with this amount of change in the OCT, we would have been able that this patient was progressing. How about the ganglion cell layer? So it has less sensitivity than the retinal nerve fiber layer, but it's better than the peripapillary retinal nerve fiber layer to detect changes in advanced glaucoma because the macula has a little bit more of range. So this floor, head, this floor head, head effect sorry, occurs later in time. So for the variability of the macula, the significant amount of change is four. And again, there's some decrease with time with aging that is a little bit less in the macula, and it's about 0.32 microns per year. And in, the, in, in cases like this patient that has an advanced glaucoma, all the superior field is gone. It looks more or less stable, the 24-2. If we take a look at the OCT retinal nerve fiber layer, it's stable over time. Why? Because we are in the floor effect. But if we look at the macula, there are some changes here that are exceeding this micron and some focal changes, paracentral changes occurring in the ganglion cell layer that basically probably our 24-2 is not capable to detect. So very likely this patient is progressing uh, centrally. Also, there are some studies showing that, again, combining parameters is useful. So structurally, sometimes for your patient, macula will be better. Sometimes for your patient, uh, retinal nerve fiber layer will be better. So the nicest way is to detect uh, things in combination 
and also to use deviation maps, which are sometimes useful, like in this patient, in which you can see how this structure and function uh, in the structure of both parameters at the same time, we can see that this was getting deeper before actually the uh, defect in the visual field appears. So sometimes having all the picture in your head is very helpful to see what's, what's happening. And now in conclusion, the take home messages that, that I would like you to, to have is that, oh, sorry, because this is the wrong, Sorry, sorry for that, because this was not the... There, yeah, sorry. So the take home messages now is the correct one that I want you to have is that quality is extremely important, that you need to check signal strength, rule out artifacts, that combining all available parameters is the best way to evaluate structure. That structure and function depends on the severity that OCT is better in early glaucoma, not so much in advanced glaucoma in which you have a floor effect, that macular damage is much more frequent than we think and that it's underrepresented in the most used 24-2 field, that it's important not to evaluate only statistically significant change, but clinically significant change in terms of progression. Uh, take into account that slopes are not corrected by age, so you have to exceed that normal effect of aging. And on top of this, please remember that OCT results do not provide diagnosis on their own, so you have to evaluate all this together with a clinical examination. And that's all uh, that I wanted to say. Thank you very much for your attention. So again, a lot of information, and um, there are some questions that came in about the wealth of information that was shared in both of these talks, which was totally expected, uh, and one of the reasons why these sessions are recorded, so you can go back and, and play and replay. I'm still playing and replaying the basic lectures that, that I had 20 years ago in residency. Um, some of the questions that came up in the Q&A, um, I had to look up just now, um, some of the basic stuff that we just, we don't think of, and you know, a lot of us went through some of the basic training uh, with, um, you know, other medical uh, techniques. So one of the corollaries that I think of is when you're looking at an EKG, right, and you're trying to figure out heart pattern, you get so good at it, you look and you say this patient's fine, or this patient's having a heart attack, right? It's kind of the same thing for a visual field where uh, I think it was Marta that said this, that it smells like glaucoma, right? <laughs> And so when you're looking at, at a nerve, even if you're looking at one nerve and not comparing to see if there's a difference between the two sides, sometimes you can just tell, even without a notch, you're, there's something about the nerve that is saying, look, look more closely. Um, and that's part of, of the art of what we do with eye care, right? So I have a bunch of questions that I have listed. Uh, I'm going to try and go through as many as possible, but I would encourage the audience to continue to put questions into the Q&A. Um, I've answered about 35 or so of the questions that came through. So, um, and then when it got to things that I wanted to discuss live, I, I um, left it for this part of the discussion. So thank you again to both of you, really great talks. And I'll go back and myself, I'll listen to this and, and my residents I know will go in and, and take a look as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna start off with a very uh, unfair question to both of you. Great. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a great way to start it, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so there were some questions um, that um, came in from a couple of different um, audience members about, hey, this is great if you have access to a visual field in an OCT, but if you're in an area that is resource limited, um, what can you do? So for both of you, and maybe we can start off with Danica about this, um, if you were going to a low resource area and you were doing um, uh, clinical care in that area, how would you approach glaucoma care differently in those areas? It is a bit of an unfair question, but I served on a panel one time uh, where they said, if you were on a, des a deserted island and you could have one instrument what would it be? And I said, well, I'm going to ask for two and it's going to be a slit lamp with a tonometer and a 78 diopter lens. Uh. <laughs> I think our, you know, no matter what we talk about visual fields, no matter how interested we get in OCTs, 
our first shot at answering the question about whether a patient has glaucoma is to look at that optic nerve and look for those characteristic changes. And these other things are, you know, sort of supplementary. And, and I recognize resources are different. I, I work in an urban clinic in Houston, Texas, and I have some patients that have lots of resources. And I personally have lots of resources in my clinic, but some patients don't have insurance or they don't, they can't afford the care. And so there's no doubt that we have to modify what we're doing for the given situation. But I think that we will never be able to throw away our um, interpretation of the optic nerve. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah. Mark, yeah, what do you I, think? I, I totally agree with Danica. And I, I always try to teach to my residents that this is a glaucomatous neuropathy. So you need, you need to look at the nerve. Mm -hmm. It's just yeah. like, you know, being a heart doctor and not listening to the heart, you know, there's, yeah. it doesn't make sense. So this is the first thing and nothing is going to substitute this. As uh, Danica said, these are complementary tools that are very helpful that, you know, especially for, for maybe tricky cases, which are not the rule can help. But if I only had to have one thing, it would be to looking at the nerve for sure. So I'm, I'm going to agree with both of you. I, I think, um, most uh, clinical practices, clinicians who are, are trained um, in uh, doing eye exams have access to some sort of tool to look at the optic nerve. And um, even those tools can be very expensive depending on where you are. But I think that's sort of the bare necessity of diagnosing and following, being able to access the optic nerve, whether it's direct or indirect. Um, in the future, it would be really nice to have access to less expensive tools that leverage artificial intelligence that can then look at the optic nerve <laughs> and then tie in um, what um, the system might have learned from looking at visual field and OCT along with that optic nerve. So, you know, my dream and one thing we're working on here at the university is to be able to get a system with an algorithm that is so trained that you can look at the optic nerve and predict the OCT and predict the visual field just by looking at that. And that can be done with minimal expense once the system is trained. So yeah. um, uh, I'll also say this, that um, CyberSight has an AI tool where clinicians from all over the world, um, depending on some of the regulatory aspects, of course, that, that play into it, can upload photos of the optic nerve or the retina. And you can get expert opinion as well through some of the clinicians that work with CyberSight. So that's another tool that I'll throw out there um, if you don't have access to all the fancy um, you know, diagnostics that we use. Um, speaking of fancy diagnostics, one, one thing that came up briefly is 24-2C uh, from a visual field standpoint. We had a few questions on that. I'll start off by saying that in our clinic, we have 11 glaucoma clinicians along you know, with, with our adjunct faculty. Everybody will do, will do things slightly differently, right? <laughs> But 24-2C uh, is one of the things that caught on with all of us, and uh, we are using it a, a great deal with our patients. So I'm wondering what, what the two of you do. And again, I'll start with Denica um, after the visual field lecture. So how are you using 24-2C and what recommendations do you have for that? Yeah, I, I would say I'm early in my learning curve simply because we had four units that didn't have that capability. We replaced one. Now we've replaced a second. So, you know, depending on where the patient has their visual field run, I may not be able to get it. <clears throat> I'm still learning how to look at it, right? It's It looks strange. It looks like the paper got, you know, skewed in the printer because of those strange little uh, circles in the middle. Um, I think it is a really valuable tool. I, I, I think we struggle a little bit with trying to decide, do we do a 24-2 or a 10-2? I was at a meeting where I can't remember who said it, but they said, you know, a 10 2 is a missed opportunity at a 24 2. And so, you know, you're, you're hedging your bets when you run one or the other. And so, this kind of almost hybrid, not exactly, but kind of hybrid is really nice because I do see those macular changes on OCT pretty frequently. And I think you may be able to pick them up a little bit earlier. So, my goal is to adopt it a little more frequently now that I have two instruments that do it. Okay. Marta, what do you think? Are you, do you have access to 24 2 C? Yeah, yeah, we, we, we have it uh, and we've been using it and, and I'm, I'm a little bit like you, we're using it more and more, you know, mm -hmm. I think that's uh, good in those patients in which re you really think that you may find uh, e even before the, the ganglion cell layer is affected, mm -hmm. you know, if you have a patient with normal tension glaucoma, I will clearly go for that. Yeah. And then uh, if I see a point there, then I will maybe study further with a, with a 10-2. Yeah. 
uh, but but that's very helpful because you really catch easily uh, some you know paracentral early damage that you would have missed, and you don't need to do you know one test and then the other test. So we sometimes uh, we do this more and more even for screening. Yeah. So same here. And and um, one of the questions that came through that I thought was a, a really good question about. 24-2 potentially being too fast. Will some of the patients actually get overwhelmed with the speed? And I, I had that worry uh, initially, there are some patients who cannot handle a 24-2C, in which case we take them back to 24-2 and, and um, those patients do fine. There is a flip side to that where 24-2 um, might be too slow and fatiguing <laughs> for, for many of the patients. And the faster algorithm, while it might um, miss on some levels, will actually allow patients to be more alert during the testing and the quality of, of the information that you're getting um, will be good. Now, there are some subtleties that probably go beyond this discussion about making sure that you don't tie in the uh, VFI or the uh, progression of 24-2C directly with 24-2. A 10-2 is still going to give you a ton of information from a central standpoint that 24-2C um, isn't going to give you. Uh, but um, I think it's telling that our entire faculty have switched over to standard 24-2C, and the other tests are actually the exception now. So it's a, it's a really important point. Uh, not everybody just... has access, but I think it's, it, it'll increase uh, as people renew their machines. You're going to get more and more access to it. Go ahead, Danica. Sorry. That, that faster algorithm, uh, that's the only way that the 24-2C is available, is faster. And for patients who have a long history of doing just, <clears throat> excuse me, C to standard or C to fast test, you know, I always have that little worry when you transition them. But I think if you tell them, look, this test goes faster, you need to be really alert when you're doing it. They kind of, I, I think most of my patients have been able to handle that transition. Um, but, but I do tell them, especially if they haven't done visual fields before, I don't mention it, but if they've done the other strategies, I tell them, look, this is a, a design to go much faster. You're going to have to sort of um, eat your Wheaties and be ready to, you know, be ready to go on this one. Yeah, I prescribe coffee before my 24-2. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They have to be, I was going to say the same. They have to be awake. <laughs> yeah. yeah. They have to be yeah. awake. Yeah, yeah. I love and, it when know, my I, patients come in and they say, sorry, Dr. Cook, I fell asleep during this test. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. It's like, yeah, it's like, I can tell. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, but on the other hand, it's also faster. So so some of, some patients really really think that it's a long time to do the test. So it's also, it's also good for yeah. those patients. Yeah. yeah. And just a general comment here for everybody listening in that's seeing patients uh, once every couple of years, take a visual field test. Um, don't take the 24-2C um, and have your patients, you know, use it unless you take it yourself first. So you can see the differences mm -hmm. because then you can communicate it much better. So when we have yeah. residents and fellows rotating, we actually ask them to go ahead and, and do the test so that they can get an idea. Um, one of the subtleties with visual field uh, in glaucoma is um, patients with poor vision uh, who are coming in and have a baseline of uh, poor uh, visual acuity. Um, what things, Marta, what, what do you do that's different for a patient who might come in who needs visual field testing, who has pretty poor vision, including um, compromised central vision? Would you still do a visual field? What's your cutoff? How do you think of that? I I mean, we we do have a very good uh, optometrist team, which are trained for those situations. I really like to try to have a visual field test because this is the functional, the only functional tool that I really have, you know? Mm -hmm. So I would do whatever, at least to try it as much as I, as I possibly can. Um, also, as I said, uh, visual field is the gold standard for assessing progression. So it's really the way that you're hundred percent sure that that this patient is progressing, right? So I, I, I would not like to miss that opportunity. Having said that, I sometimes increase the size stimulus. Mm -hmm. um, that helps for those patients. Uh, sometimes we change, uh, you know, the, the and, and you really have to be with them all the tests. You know, you always have to be with them all the tests, but in these patients even more, particularly, right. even show them that they can you know, stop the test if, if they are feeling stressed or something. Uh, but those, those will be my, my, my ways of doing this. But I think you, you really need to work together with your optometrist team closely. Yeah. Uh, so we are on the same page. 
Yeah. Uh, we Danica, we'll, what do you think? Yep. Yeah, we'll switch to a size five target yeah. if you're getting very low values on the 24-2. A pearl I learned from a neuro-ophthalmologist that I worked with a long time ago was if your patient can count fingers, they'll be able to see a size five target. And so if they have, if they can't count your fingers, you're not going to be able to get any kind of an automated parametry test done. But if they can count your fingers, but they have a lot of really low values on their uh, size three target, or if they have poor Snell and acuity, um, they can probably do a size five. And there's actually better repeatability with a size five than with a size three. And so while you don't, you lose your ability to, to um, do progression software, you can still follow a size five visual field um, over time for change. It just requires, a, it's a little more cumbersome to um, detect that change. Yeah, I think those are all uh, great pointers. One thing that we don't talk about as much is uh, the differences between kinetic and static testing. Mm -hmm. We don't do the kinetic testing as much as we used to. It really depends on a uh, technician running it that is very good. Uh, but the communication and the actual interaction between the person administering the test and the patient can bring out some findings that you're not going to get from the static testing that we're more accustomed to. Uh, so that's another thing that I, I throw out. It doesn't always help, but in certain patients, um, going from static back to kinetic or to kinetic, a lot of my patients have never taken the kinetic test <laughs> um, and, and seeing if you get something out of that uh, would be good. Now, what if um, a scenario that came up in a few of the questions what if you have disagreement between, what if the two of you are arguing and there was disagreement between the visual field and the OCT? And I'll start off with, with Marta with, for this one. So um, when you're seeing a patient, you have basically three main pieces to the puzzle. You have your optic nerve exam, potentially photo, OCT and visual field. What do you do when you have disagreements between them? Who wins? How do you think of that? Well, again, as I said, you know, the structure function relationship disagrees in the, over the spectrum yeah. of the neuropathy. So it's not, it's, it's going to be very likely that there's some disagreement. So you need to understand first in which area of this spectrum you're situated. So early in time, <clears throat> OCT structure will win. Of course, for as, as we said with Danica, examination is the first, right? But regarding structure and function, early in time, structure will win. Probably later in time, function be, will win. And if there's disagreement in the middle situation, then for me, my clinical examination, the intraocular pressure, all the clinical things will also be very important. Yeah, yeah I agree with all those. Danica, what do you think? Yeah, I think when we don't have agreement, so I think there's a difference in disagreement and lack of agreement. So if we have, um, you know, oh, this is a little visual field defect, I might have predicted that it would be bigger. I don't think that's necessarily disagreement. Uh, or it's maybe disagreement, it's not lack, it's lack of agreement. Mm -hmm. If I have one that says the superior rim is, or the superior nerve fiber layer is bad, and I have a superior visual field, that's disagreement, right? That's really different. And then you kind of have to say, one of these tests isn't right. Something, there's an artifact, there's, you know, something's not right. So I tell my students, glaucoma is not always easy, but it always makes sense. You're never going to have superior nerve fiber layer loss that correlates with a superior visual field defect. That's just not how the eye works. And so I think um, making sure that you're not looking at artifactual information um, and then going back and saying, well, is this really glaucoma? Is this something else that's going on in, and not glaucoma? So um, I think there's some subtleties there, but I, I agree that the clinical exam is going to win every time. And sometimes too, those are the cases that you wait and see what happens, right? Is there change? Is it repeatable? Um, you know, instead of making decisions on one day, one set of testing. Yeah, I say that to to my fellows frequently. That one of the main reasons I went into glaucoma is you can always have the patient come back for testing. Yeah. <laughs> yes. that's so I, true. I say step down from the ledge, right? Step right. down from the ledge. You don't have to jump today, right? We can just take a step back and say, "Is this urgent?" No. Okay. Well, let's see what happens next time the patient comes in. Yeah, an, an example of that was uh, recently a couple of weeks ago. We had a patient who came in, and the testing didn't make sense at all. 
And um, I went and I put some artificial tears in, walked the patient over for visual field again and had the fellow go in and take a look. She's like, yeah, it looks totally different. <laughs> so, so we have to be aware that the testing uh, can have disagreement. I like, I like what you said, lack of agreement. You know, the, the, the way you think of it is um, it can be influenced by so many different things. Yeah. Um, one question that came up, a couple of them actually were um, directed more towards octopus than Humphrey visual field. I personally don't use octopus testing. I read about it and then I kind of forget about it because we don't use it daily. But um, so I'll start off with Danica. Do you, do you use octopus uh, testing at all? And um, how do you think of it? How, if somebody's asking you during a lecture, you know, which one should I use? How would you answer that? I, I don't have one, so I don't use it. But I've done a lot of reading because you know I always feel like I'm giving a one-sided uh, a view of things. The octopus perimeter was is a really great perimeter. It has a lot of great test patterns. You can actually um, go in and do a customized test pattern. So if your patient had like a superior nasal step, you can go in and, and increase the testing spacing or decrease the spacing uh, in that particular area. There are a lot of customized things you can do. And again, they have analogous software for pretty much everything that the, that the um, Humphrey field analyzer has. I don't use it. I think one of the things that's always tricky is, can I interchange them? And I really don't think you can. I was thinking about an analogy. I don't know if this will ring true or not. I like to run and I have Nike shoes and I have Adidas shoes, right? And I can run with either one, but I'm not going to run with one on each foot, right? <laughs> and so I, you know, I think what you start with is the one that you stay with. I don't think, I think you can get into trouble trying to compare them. Although you're going to see similar things. If you took a single field of each, you're going to see similar things. I don't think you can use them to watch for progression. I don't think this, the thresholds are going to be, ex I don't think it's going to be comparable. Yeah, I agree with that. Martha, what do you think yeah. about that? We, we don't use it either. Uh, I've, I completely agree with, with, with Danica. And, and I think actually the octopus is, is a very good perimeter. Yeah. That, that's what I know. That's what I've read. Um, so I also think it's important to do the point that if you have an octopus, you're, you're good. You, know? you just have to stick to your perimeter. Mm -hmm. It's not that you need to change now. Uh, mm -hmm. But I don't have enough experience uh, with it. Yeah, I would say the same thing about OCT as well. Just you know, yes. we've covered both topics. So Cirrus, Spectralis, whatever you might be using with, with whatever company, as long as you're sticking to the same machine. We've done studies to show that you can't really uh, no. put an Adidas on one foot and a Nike on no, the no, other. No, 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 no. They are not <laughs> interchangeable at all. Right. Yeah, but they're all good. They're all yeah. um, of high value. And I think if you have a machine you're using it, you should be fine. And I do think it's really critical to learn everything you can about your instrument, right? So I always say, love the one you're with. Like, I'm not going to tout one instrument is better than another, but whatever you have, learn everything you can about it. What are the subtleties? What are the pitfalls? What are the benefits of the instrument that you have or that you're considering purchasing? Because they're all good instruments. You just got to figure out the best way to use the one you have. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, you need to know your quality. Mm -hmm. You need to know how we measure things because it's not exactly the same sometimes the parameters for example for the macula some yes. instruments measure the three layers some of them measure only one layer some mm -hmm. of them measure so you you just need to understand and then to specifically know how to look at your device how does your device checks for progression it's fine just use your device and as you said take out the most of your particular device yeah yeah, I think one big challenge for industry, uh, it's always a tough discussion to, to have, but the cost of the machines, uh, if there's a way to have sort of like we do for cataract machines where we have, you know, maybe a simpler grade that can travel with the surgeon and then there are more complicated machines. If we can have um, more cost efficient visual field and OCT uh, testing capability, uh, that's, I think, a big challenge. I know some companies are trying to address that, but it would be good to see so that more clinics have access to it and can build up a database around, around those machines. Um, one question that came up was, um, we can show everybody's age by uh, recognition of these terms. You know, GDX is something that's oh. not talked about anymore. Um, HRT. So I, I was in training during the GDX, HRT, OCT war. Right. So they were, I was, yeah. I was resident at that point. So, so I, I was, I was there. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, I did my fellowship with Joel Schumann, who was one of the inventors of, of OCT, but his clinic always had GDX HRT. We did all three tests on all patients. It was part of his research. 
And when I first moved to Colorado, I, um, I was determined to get an HRT. I had it in my clinic. I used it along with OCT and then woke up one day and HRT was no longer being renewed from a software standpoint. GDX fell to the wayside for multiple reasons. Um, if people have access to those machines, which I don't think are being serviced, at least the GDX, I think is, is completely um, offline. Um, did we lose anything by losing GDX and HRT or is it just kind of progress and we have OCT now and it's doing just fine? I'll, I'll start off with Marta with this one um, after the OCT talk. So how do you think of those two things? HRT, so, uh, GDX. Yeah, so GDX I think is, is, is out. And, and I don't think we have lost a lot. Basically yeah. what it did, it was, uh, it, it was measuring thickness indirectly because actually it was like a bi-referengence thing. So it was not true thickness. It was, yeah, an idea of a function, but you know, it turned out that it was not uh, as much as, 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 as it had to be. So GDX, it's fine. I, I was worried a little bit at the beginning with HRT because actually I like the progression analysis. I think the progression analysis by HRT was, was very good. Yeah. Um, I, was, I did my fellowship with Jack Tioffi. He was an HRT man, as you know. Yeah. Uh, and at the beginning, some of my patients, when we still had the two, that I had a lot of information for a long time with HRT, I, I, I was still doing some HRT to them. Um, I think that now currently all these you know, changes and evolutions. I mean, the OCT now is much better than the OCT then. Mm -hmm. I think that now we have these pseudo histology images, you know, that you can see. I mean, soon we will see with active optics, maybe even the little ganglion cells, you know. Yeah. I'm sure now OCT is better. But at some point, HRT was, was very good. And if there's some people out there that's following a patient with HRT, I think that the important is your analysis over time. So this information is of, of some value, at least for me. I think the biggest thing we lost was all that time that we had, all of yeah. those exams yeah. that we had. Those are gone. That didn't, that didn't transfer to any other instrument. And I think the companies have gotten better about having newer instruments be backward compatible because in the you know, I think at the end of the day, what we're looking at is, has this changed and has it changed at a rate that's alarming to me? Do I need to amplify my therapy? Uh, and when we, you know, I actually really liked the GDX, um, but then when we went strictly to OCT for a while, we were doing both. And then we went strictly to OCT. And it's like, oh, I have years of information on this uh, patient on GDX. I don't have that anymore. So I think the main thing we lost was, you know, those individual patients back data. And, and, you know, it's just one of those things you say, well, I don't have it and I have yeah. to start from scratch. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes we just have to do that. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> sort of dovetailing into that is the, the new transition that's happening on a slow scale, slow, smaller scale is the um, VR headsets. Mm. Um, and we're seeing a lot of uh, companies, a couple of them have actually come and gone. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really a tough field to be in. And it's mostly been centered on visual field testing, but there are goggles now that are being introduced on a, a very early level that can do OCT um, and or tabletop uh, sets that can be you know, taken to the home or, or rented out. Um, what do you either both of you, I'd, I'd like to hear from both of you, how do you think of VR visual field testing and how that might play into your clinical practice? And we'll start off with Danica. So I, I will uh, disclose that I have not used one. I don't have one available to me. I have sat in on some um, uh, seminars, some sort of consulting advisory board panels with a couple of different instruments. And I think that there's a lot of appeal, right? It's small. You don't have to go into a dark room. You can do it in any place. It's fast. Patients accept it really well. Um, at this point, I don't think we have enough good data that we're going to be able to follow glauco glaucoma patients over time. I think it would probably be good for a screening. It might even, you might even could get a threshold test, although I think the dynamic range is not as large as with um, a traditional visual field unit. So I can imagine that in a place where you're trying to quickly identify, you need something that's quick, you need something that's um, maybe inexpensive, I can see the appeal of it, but I don't think it's quite ready for prime time in terms of managing glaucoma patients over the long time. I, I'd I'm intrigued by it, but I just don't think we're there yet. And I think the fact that we've seen companies come and go is a little bit of an indication of that right now. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think, Marta? 
Yeah, I have not used uh, VR sets, but I have uh, seen uh, goggles that do visual feel we've used for some time. Uh, not not a, long, a lot of patients, but some patients. And also with tablets, which was the previous, um, uh, the previous software. And um, as, as, as Danica said, there's a lot of appeal in general for home monitoring, you know, so, so that's also good that the patient is there, that, but there's not enough data. And I'm also worried about these, uh, the, the, the repetitability, you know, there are some things, you know, the fixation, how you, how you make sure that there's no movement, all these kind of things that I think there's, we, we need more data, more time. And, um, I don't have experience with uh, with the virtual, virtual reality ones. Maybe you you can uh, tell us your experience with that, Malik. But yeah. um, but uh, those are the future, I suppose. Um, yeah, I, I think it is the future for certain patients, um, and I think it's sort of to be determined if it can replace um, Humphrey or Octopus that we're using more frequently. So we are we are using a system. Um, I personally looked at several systems on the floor at Academy and other meetings. I've done it myself. We have one system that we brought into uh, the clinic that we've been using, and patients love it when they're when they're using it. Um, it goes back to the conversation of you cannot take the visual field data from the goggles and or from the you know VR headset and um, apply it to Humphrey or Octopus. Progression mm -hmm. analysis is almost non-existent, um, but Patients who have physical limitations who can't sit at the Humphrey or Octopus, I think that's a really good uh, place for it. So I think in the future, most practices that are tertiary care centers that are seeing a lot of patients who might be the more difficult patient to take care of, um, you almost need to have this type of thing sitting there uh, to, to take care of patients. Um, the other thing that I think is going to start happening is you'll start seeing some of the companies sort of go by the wayside and you'll start seeing the other, the survivors sort of build up and getting the normative database. Um, and the other place where I think this is going to shine is in screening. So if you're taking this out into low resource areas, if you're in the middle of nowhere and you have a couple of goggles, I think it'll be very effective in, in um, screening patients. Um, so for the sake of time, I'm going to go to a couple of questions that I think might be more rapid fire. One of them is about normative databases. So if you're looking at OCT in kids, for example, where we don't have a pediatric normative database, uh, Marta, how do you think about seeing, let's say the patient is 12, maybe got diagnosed with ocular hypertension, probably because they were squeezing uh, during, <laughs> during the test. Um, how do you look at them for OCT and use of OCT in that patient population? Well, I do, um, what I do is, again, this clin clinical examination is important. Uh, as, as we said, but then I use them to compare with themselves rather right. than to have a database because there's no database over there. Um, you have to think, and, 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 and you will know, but I didn't mention these in the talk, but you'll be amazed that most of the database are not that many patients. Yeah. And even for the patients in which you have the age, yeah. some uh, OCTs, the database was built in 300 patients maybe. Yep. You know, it's not that that much. So even, you know, with our patients, our normal patients, maybe the database is not exactly there for a particular patient with the characteristics of our patient. So what I do is in these cases, I compare the patient with, with himself, with herself uh, over time, which is yeah. all I can do. Yeah, the, other key, the other key thing I think about it is, um, I don't remember learning this. I'm older than both of y'all, but I don't remember learning this when I learned about glaucoma, but asymmetry is so key. And when you have, every instrument has the T-SNIT or n stin curve superimposed, right eye over left eye, right? We don't have normative databases, but we can see asymmetry, right? And so that would be a really key thing to look at because asymmetry is hallmark in glaucoma, right? Left asymmetry, top bottom asymmetry in your nerve, in your field, in your OCT. So that would be one other thing that you could look at. Um, I think it's worth getting because you will be able to track changes over time, but uh, you, you, you know, you just know what your limitation is when you're using yeah. it. Yeah, I think um, it, it goes back to one of the, the gifts for glaucoma is that we have time and longitudinal data um, will always be king in what we do. So you can do that for a pediatric patient. You can also apply this. Some of the other questions that were coming in were about tilted nerves. Mm -hmm. um, in a highly myopic nerve, you can look at change over time and is it following progression in a glaucomatous pattern or not? 
there was a question that came in about shifted bundles and what does that mean? So you can certainly have a shifted bundle that doesn't follow the T-SNIT rule and uh, looking at that over time will also uh, give you some insight. Um, so there are a lot of uh, pearls here about don't just look at one test and make a determination. Now, sometimes the patient will come in, they have a notch, they have a, a nerve fiber layer hemorrhage, um, and their pressure is 28, right? So, <laughs> so it's basically a gimme and you know what's going on. But more often than not, uh, patients are coming in and you're seeing their baseline and saying, come back in a few months and, and let's take a look. So I'm going to close off here with more of a comment that I think is really important from a, a friend of, of uh, Orbis, uh, Shiko Matenge. Uh, some of you can see her question in the Q&A section. A very experienced clinician. Um, she is on the retina side of things, but um, is um, taking some time to listen to some glaucoma discussions, which I'm very appreciative. But she put a question in here about uh, we talk about representation uh, data in AI, but not necessarily with visual field in OCT. How representative is the normative data target uh, with based interpretations uh, in these gadgets, so in visual field in OCT, which is exactly what you just touched on. So this is a big problem that we need to address. And I, you know, I'm getting sort of on my soapbox to talk about this. Um, we talk about getting less expensive devices like visual field and OCT that we can use in low middle income countries use it globally, but we can't forget about representative data. And we can go as basic as intraocular pressure, the, norm, the normal range that we follow is based on very few patients who, in most cases, when you look at the data, we're mostly Caucasian, right? So we're not looking at a wide range of patients. And it's exactly the same thing with visual field and OCT, where if you take this machine and you go into Sub-Saharan Africa to use it, the normative database is not representative of that population. So the fix for that is longitudinal data. <laughs> and I'll keep saying that, that um, you don't go by, by one test, you can follow over time. Um, I, I know our, our time is up here. It's, um, it's already um, the half hour um, uh, point. So we've gone for about an hour and a half and we've learned a ton. Um, I thought both of your talks were amazing. I'm gonna go back and listen to both once it's up uh, in a few hours on CyberSight. Um, so to the speakers, I'll say thank you. Hopefully we can do another session. I learned things like comparing some of what I do to wearing a Nike on one foot, Adidas on the <laughs> other. I will be using that in some of my lectures and I will, will not attribute it to you. I'll say it came off the top of my head. Um, and Martha, I know you're, you're very busy and you've been traveling recently too. So thank you for making time uh, in your busy day um, and, and giving an, an excellent talk that I, I thought covered a lot of the basics. To all of those who um, are listening in on Zoom, please go to CyberSight, <clears throat> not just for this talk, but for many others, the library that's in there, all of the courses that you can take. Uh, we have textbooks that are in there in PDF format that you can also download and use for free. Uh, so please enjoy that. Write in any questions also on CyberSight and we can get to some of those. So thank you to the speakers. Thank you to all of those who uh, Zoomed in today and uh, have a good rest of your day wherever you are in the world. Thank you very much.